I'm Mike McKinley. I'm a pastor in Northern Virginia, and I'm joined up here by our uh, distinguished panel for this evening. So over here is Simon Gathercall, who's a professor at Cambridge University in England. Uh, Dr. Duncan, the BD, Mark Dever, and Al Mohler uh, will also be known to you. And this uh, is, we've entitled this Stump the Panel. And uh, there's a couple different ways this could go. <laughs> but full disclosure, we're not really going to try and stump you guys. Because while that would be in some ways satisfying for the 7,000 of us <laughs> to perhaps see you guys speechless, uh, it wouldn't be all that edifying. So what we have are some questions that have been sent in on video. Some are emailed in in writing, uh, particularly getting practical about the topic of evangelism. So we've heard great exhortations to prayer and confidence in the word and evangelism. So now we want to get specific with some of the questions people have either that unbelievers uh, pose to us or even that we might have as we think about reaching out to people around us uh, and get some specific answers from you guys. So with that said, let's go ahead and roll video one and then we will get going. Hey guys, this is Dan Adams from Redeemer Church in Pace, Florida. My question is, is that in 1 Samuel 15 and other passages, it it says that God ordered the destruction of men, women, children, and all kinds of animals. Uh, in particular, in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, it is related to uh, Amalek. And God says that he wants them devoted to destruction because they opposed Israel when they were coming up out of Egypt. What is a good answer, do you think, for someone who notes this, say, a, say an atheist friend who says, you know, what, what kind of God orders the destruction of people who live generations later for something uh, their ancestors did? Um, what kind of God is this? Okay, Lig, do you want to start off there with unbelievers wrestling with Amalek. Sure. The, um, the passage is about the Amalekites and it's a delayed judgment on the Amalekites. You'll remember when the children of Israel were going into Canaan, they were supposed to wipe out all of the Canaanites. The Amalekites were not wiped out. They'd been a thorn in the flesh. And now in this passage, uh, Saul has given instructions about dealing with them, which he doesn't follow through on. Um, and this, in that regard, this passage is similar to a number of other passages that have brought what we would call a genocide objection to God in the Old Testament. It's interesting to me that Moses himself is aware, as he writes the first five books of the Bible, that there are going to be people with moral questions about the activity of God in relation to the wicked. So, for instance, in Genesis, when the Noah cycle begins, there is a moral preface to the flood story in which Moses explains, this is why God is going to do this. It's because of justice. The wickedness of people on the earth cried out for justice to be administered. So what you're about to see is not capricious meanness it's the display of deserved justice. The same thing will happen when God makes the promises to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15. In Genesis 15, he specifically says, I'm going to give you this land, but the children of Israel are going to be enslaved, and then you're going to come out, and you're going to go into the land, and you're going to destroy all its inhabitants because... The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In other words, Moses is saying again, the, the, the destruction of the Canaanites is a moral judgment by a righteous God. He has been long-suffering with their disobedience. His patience is going to come to an end, and in 400 years he is going to bring judgment upon them. And Meredith Klein in his expositions of those passages says what we see here is a glimpse of the final judgment intruding upon these scenes in the history of Israel. It's just a little foretaste of the judgment of the wicked to come. So I think the first thing, and there's a lot more to say, and, and Al and I actually have had a conversation about this, I want to hear from him, but one thing to say is within the text of scripture itself, 
there are justifications of these actions that are based on the righteousness of God. These are not capricious, mean, uh, nonsensical acts. These are ethical judgments that are being rendered. I agree with everything. I agree with everything Lincoln just said, and uh, I simply want to come back behind him and say that you start in exactly the right place when you go to the beginning of the Noah narrative. Because from that point onward in biblical history, the amazing thing is that any live, That's right. not that any are destroyed. Because God himself declares that wickedness is so great upon the earth that, uh, that he will act in justice and in righteousness to execute this judgment. And you know, there are many people right now with all the conversation about the Noah movie and all the rest who are all of a sudden understanding perhaps that narrative for the very first time. And, and they're all of a sudden realizing that it's not a cute little Bible story, that it is a horrifying story of God's judgment along with the incredible promise of God's unmerited favor. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Yeah. So from, in terms of biblical history, the flow of biblical history, from the point of, of, of the beginning of that Noah narrative onward, the, 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 the grace is that any would live. And, and the reality is, and, and I think Klein's right about this, the Bible reminds us that God's judgment is delayed. It, the judgment is already a function of his character. It is just delayed in terms of human history, and you do see this from time to time break out. And of course, this also points out the, the radical contrast between the biblical worldview and, and the modern secular worldview. The modern secular worldview assumes the humanity is the standard of justice, and, and thus that whatever God does must meet the, the, the standards of human justice. When, when God himself is declared, as you read in, in Job, and part of that was read for us today, and God himself says, it, it is entirely mine to decide life or death. And it is entirely in terms of his own sovereignty, but also every other one of his perfections, his righteousness, his justice, his grace, and his mercy. It should make us all the more grateful that we live. And if I can take a tip from Christopher Hitchens on this. Yes. <laughs> uh, when people say that the Jesus of the New Testament is not like that God of the Old Testament, yes. Hitchens rightly points out that Jesus in the book of Revelation makes that pale in comparison right. to the judgment to come. First Samuel 15 will pale That's in comparison right. to the judgment to come. You know, and Hitchens there is indicative of the new atheists who, who will, are distinct from that older tradition of atheism at precisely that point, Lee, where they come back and say, look, that older distinction, because the original atheists, you know, and, and, and I'll say original, but in the early 20th century, the modern atheistic movement, you have people like Bertrand Russell and others, that they, they stayed away from Jesus, but not Christopher Hitchens, not Richard Dawkins and others, and as they say, if you've read the book, you can't possibly have this false distinction between a judgmental father and uh, a, a very, you know, a Jesus in the model of modern right. tolerance. Right. Uh, I agree with all that's been said. I would just say practically one thing you could do to say to such a person is just ask them the question, do you think God is ever justified to take life? When do you think God is justified to take life? That's good. And then that gets you into the conversation. That's that, good. That they're really good. And I'm on a similar line of, of sort of questioning. I, I'd want to ask them if they have ever created anything themselves. And, and what they assume they have the right to do as the creator of something. Uh, because what the question goes to is the, the rightness and the goodness of God in disposing his own creation. Uh, and so it's attacking him as creator. And, and I'd want to sort of back up into that a little bit and say, if God is creator, what rights does he have over his creation? And, and certainly these questions about justice flow out as well. Yeah. I'm very to Alan, Megan points out that this is a delayed judgment. It's, it's hard to see that a delayed judgment is an unfair judgment. I mean, mm -hmm. if, um, if the judgment had taken place earlier, these people wouldn't have even existed in the later generations. A great story from Jesus to use, if you want to have that long a conversation, is Matthew 20, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, to show that everything that he gives above what they deserve is grace. Do we have any hell questions in this? I'm not sure I'm allowed to tell you, if but you, no. If you, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't, let me just say that the question is not unakin to questions about yeah. the justice of hell. Yeah. And I, I remember one of, one of the most brilliant 
uh, young women that I ever had the privilege of discipling. She was in the youth group when I was a youth pastor in St. Louis. I had a father who was an unbeliever. We were working through, uh, I can't remember what passage in the Bible we were working through, but the idea of hell bothered her. She had been in a church where the Bible had not been taught. She was coming into contact with the idea of hell for the first time. Yeah. And it was this question of the justice of that. Is it, is it right for yeah. God to send someone to hell? And that's not unakin to yeah. this kind of a question. Yeah. And actually, let me stop you right there, because actually the next question oh, does, now that I look at it, does sort of touch on this. It's the emotional sort of connection with right. that idea. So right. let me go ahead and play the right. second oh, video, yeah, and then we'll good. pick up right there. My name is Sean Sheeran. I'm a pastor at Hesford Baptist Church in Ontario, near Toronto, in Canada. One of our church members is witnessing to a woman who recently lost her husband, who died suddenly, from a Muslim background. Upon hearing the gospel, she realizes that should she believe the gospel, she would spend eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, while her husband would spend eternity in hell. How would you help this woman wrestle through this reality? Mm. It seems like this woman's not so much wrestling with whether or not that's true, but just the emotional right. impact right. on that. So any, any thoughts how you'd approach? Well, let me, de let me defer to these brothers. I've been talking a lot, and I'll Simon, something. what do you think? It's, I mean, it, it, there's no easy answer to it, is there? Um, that there will be a lot of sorrow for that, but that one day uh, her tears will be wiped away. Um, yeah, there, there isn't really an easy answer to that, and, and in some ways, I think what you want to do is is mourn with her. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I might tell her the story of of my own father, who the first time I saw him in church was at his funeral. Um, who, for as long as I can remember, though he was at all of my little league games and and such an encouragement in many ways, was unfaithful to my mom. I have, uh, unless the Lord did something that I'm not aware of, I I suspect. Um, he went to eternity without Christ. Um, and I might just share that with her and weep with her uh, and look to the, the new heavens and the new earth and um, where, where the Lord will show that all things are right and well, he'll comfort us with his own hands and wipe every tear. We had a missions professor at RTS Jackson named Sam Rowan who recently went home to be with the Lord. And when he came to Jackson in the early 1990s to teach, he, one of the things he did is he shared his testimony with us. And he came from, uh, he was a tough kid from the streets of Philadelphia, uh, grew up Roman Catholic, very nominal sort of Roman Catholic family, tough relationship with his father, came to really love his father uh, after he became a Christian, but his father never responded to the gospel. And in the last couple of years of his life, his father contracted a, an illness that was terminal. And, and Sam really reconnected to his dad and, and shared the gospel with him over and over and over. And uh, a few weeks after his father had died, he preached a message about the sovereignty of God in chapel. And he, he told us that the, 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 the second to last time that he saw his dad, that he had been able to work all the way through the gospel and had really been able to press its claims and that his father had not responded. And then the last time he went to see his dad, his dad was in no shape to be able to respond at all. He was just, he was at that stage where there was nothing there to respond with and then he died. And he closed that sermon by saying, um, if my dad died in the state that I saw him in the last time. He died in unbelief, and I'm never going to see him again. But I want you to know that I know that whatever God ordains is right and good. And I knew that that was not coming from someone who was uninvolved in that particular situation. It was coming from someone who was taking God at his word and believing that he was good. We've already been reminded of that, that it's so important to believe that God is good. And it was from the character of God that he got his comfort in a situation for which there was no earthly comfort. And that, I've never forgotten that experience. And I'm not sure, I think you'd have to have a pretty good relationship with someone to be able to share those kinds of things. But that deeply impacted me that a brother would believe God and the word that much in that kind of a circumstance. I may have misunderstood the question, 
but if I traced it, it was of a man in this church or an individual in the church witnessing to a woman whose husband had died not knowing the Lord and is destined for hell, and she was questioning that. Well, I think of that old gospel hymn, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying, Jesus is Merciful, Jesus Will Save. I think it points to the urgency of our evangelism. You know, how we wish someone had gotten the gospel to him before he died. And I think the church needs regularly to hear this kind of thing in order to see the horror again of hell and recognize that, that we must tell with urgency because who knows who may be before us one day and gone the next. But how glad we are to be able to, to know that the gospel got to this woman and how we pray the Lord will open her heart that she would believe and believe and be saved. So, I mean, I, I do think there's that aspect of the urgency of preaching the gospel and taking the gospel to others that certainly comes out heartbreakingly in this. I think every once in a while we need to have our hearts broken by that kind of account. Well, let's move on now, uh, video three. My name is Salvador Gomez. I'm a pastor in Iglesia Biblica del Señor Jesucristo in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. And my question is, how do you deal with membership applicants that are living together with their partners, though they are not married, and their partners refuse to get married? Thank you. Mark, how would you respond if someone came to you for membership in the church, presumably they think they're a Christian or they want to be a Christian, they're living with someone who won't marry them? Seriously, I mean, all the church membership questions are going to me. <laughs> <laughs> we have stereotypes for a reason. wonder why. Um, all right. Um, well, I think you have to begin by realizing that Jesus taught very clearly to his disciples in Matthew 18 that if someone does not repent, you're to tell it to the church. And if they still don't repent, when the church implicit there, I think, is, is rebuking them, instructing them, rebuking them, then you treat them like a, a Gentile or a tax collector. And you can't very well receive them into membership only to put them out. I mean, I think you, you have that conversation that, listen, uh, the, the church is not for perfect people. Please don't misunderstand us. You know, the, the only people this church has anything good to offer to are to sinners. So this, is, this church is only for sinners. But inside that, we have no good news for unrepentant sinners. None. The only good news we have is for repentant sinners. That's right. So if you're a repentant sinner, we've got great news. But if you are still in your sins, you're more committed to your sin than you are to the Savior, well, we can love you, we can try to instruct you, but we don't finally have, we can't finally affirm to you, right. just to make you feel good, that you've accepted the good news of Christ. This is not a hard question. This one's not going to stump us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, one, this one's not a hard question at all because Jesus addressed it himself. So he who was unwilling to leave mother and father and sister and brother is not worthy of the kingdom. And we understand the context of that, but for crying out loud, how can we then say it's a hard question to know what to do with a live-in lover? Uh, I mean, this is, this is just one that rings with immediate gospel clarity. And we can be brokenhearted over the failure to repent, but that failure to repent in all likelihood indicates a failure to have believed the gospel. And so I, I think this one's pretty easy, even though there, hopefully it's not the end of the story. Let's, let's hope and pray that true repentance comes and that, that, frankly, belief comes to the unbelieving partner and that they not only get married but, uh, but find themselves faithful in Christ. But, but I'm, I'm right with Mark on this one. It, it, this is not hard. Now, Ligon, I'm just wondering if your Baptist brothers are being a little typically over-clear, over-realized eschatology, too pure a church, yeah. all those errors that we always, you yeah. guys think we fall into. Yeah. I'm just asking. I love you. I respect you. Just want to understand. I'm still yeah. trying to understand, Lee, in no, 25 years. No, you're not, brother. No, you're not. Yes, um, let me say that this actually, we, we were having a conversation with John MacArthur and John Piper earlier about easy believism and, and cheap grace and the denial of repentance and the promotion of a carnal Christian doctrine. This is one area where That's this right. plays in. And if I can just compliment a faithful pastor that I had the privilege of serving in St. Louis when I was a seminary and I was with Rodney Stortz at the Covenant Presbyterian Church in St. Louis, we would go out and we would visit neighbors and church visitors on Tuesday nights and share the gospel. And Rodney was very faithful. We went into a home, a home one evening and had a long conversation about the gospel with a young woman. Back in the kitchen of the home, there was a man sort of puttering around doing things. 
And this woman was very interested in the presentation of the gospel that she heard. But towards the end of the conversation, Rod said, who is that back there? Because she had, she had actually visited the church, signed the register mm -hmm. as single, but there was a man back in the home. And she said, well, that's my boyfriend. And um, Rod said, does he live here? Wow. And uh, she said, yes. And as the, prop, as the conversation went on, um, she said, would being a Christian mean that I could no longer live with my boyfriend? And Rod said, yes. That's what it would mean. And she said, I, I, can't, I can't go any further with this conversation. And it was really good for me to see not only my pastor be ready to press that home, but to see that stark rejection of God's kindness and forbearance because somebody wasn't ready to give up something that meant more to them than God. And actually, there was someone who rebuked Rodney when we got, when we got back to the church because that, that particular person at the church held us some sort of a carnal Christian doctrine. And, and I, I just saw a faithful pastor that wasn't just looking to get a number or a person in the pew, but cared about somebody's everlasting salvation and was ready to have a tough conversation. So thank you for your faithfulness in this area. Thank you, brother. Yeah. All right, well, the next question is uh, submitted in writing. So this is from Todd Morikawa in Kailua Baptist Church in Kailua, Hawaii. Uh, what, is, all right, what is our responsibility towards unbelievers who know we're Christians have heard the gospel from us before, have not expressed any interest in learning more, but we see them all the time, weekly, daily. Uh, are we meant to have gospel conversations with them every time we see them? Tabidi? Uh, we certainly have a responsibility to, to continue to plead for them in prayer. Uh, we have a responsibility to continue to speak with them of the gospel. Uh, I think we have a responsibility to probably slow down in our evangelism and realize that um, we probably heard the gospel more than one time, several times, and, and that many of the claims of the gospel, particularly in the culture that we're in, aren't claims that are immediately recognized or accepted uh, or understood by increasingly biblical, illiterate society. Uh, so to keep walking through the gospel, keep walking through aspects of the gospel, keep um, pressing in the claims of the gospel on that person's life. Again, not in a, a rude, abusive way, um, but just as simple as, hey, man, you know, we talked about this thing a couple weeks ago. Have you thought more about that? You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I, there's something else I wanted to add to that. Um, and just in the, in the course of your friendship, uh, just continue to insert that in the conversation. I think one of the most bizarre things the Apostle Paul said by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is this. He said he was under obligation to people to share the gospel with them, which is frankly kind of a bizarre way to look at it except it's actually what's revealed in Scripture. So I think when we ask the question, to whom are we obligated to share the gospel, Paul says basically to everyone who's either a Jew or a Gentile, <laughs> which uh, basically means everyone. And so you look at that and you realize, I, I think that's a very healthy corrective to us. It's, it's not that we share the gospel when we see necessarily just a strategic opening or we think we have a privileged relationship. We are, our default position is that we're under obligation but, you know, this is where the ongoing relationship with an individual helps one to gauge and to understand how to be most faithful in that, in that conversation. Um, my guess is that if you show up at every conversation just picking up where you left off, that might not be the most effective way to share the gospel. But almost any way of sharing the gospel is infinitely better than any way of not sharing the gospel. So let's share the gospel. All right, let's move on now to uh, video four. Hi guys, Jim Delver here, Trinity Church, Chickasha, Oklahoma, was having a conversation with a server at our restaurant the other night, and I asked her, hey, if you come upon me and I'm about to die, have five minutes to, 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 to live, how would you get me ready to meet God? And she said, well, I just tell you to pray. And I said, well, who would I pray to? The Hindu God, the Muslim God, the Jehovah's Witness God, the Mormon God? And she said, I would just tell you to pray to whichever God you believe in. Guys, how would you have finished that conversation? Thank you. 
I refer you to the message last night. <laughs> <laughs> so presuming you don't have an hour and a microphone, you just have a waitress in a, in a restaurant. <laughs> how would you, how would you fr boil down last night's conversation into a, a helpful interaction? Well, with, with all deference to my dear brother in Chickasha, I, I don't think that's the way I would get into the conversation because I'm not sure that it's the most helpful place to move from at that point. Uh, but if I did find myself in that situation, and God bless him for having an evangelistic intent and for being willing to, to ask a question that would lead to a theological problem, that, that's a certain achievement of sorts in, in part this case. Part of it is you, you don't know, you don't have enough diagnostic exactly. information from that question that's to know right. where she is. She could be that's a right. Christian really poorly answering that question. Or, really poorly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I guess the bottom line is I would share the gospel with her. I mean, at that point, I think I would have to back up because I think that's a part of the problem. We can find ourselves in a situation where we can get so artificial with the way we try to talk to people about the gospel, it's then hard to shift into a self-conscious conversation about the gospel. And I'm not saying that's what the dear brother did, but I'm, I'm saying there is a danger in that where all of a sudden, okay, this is no longer just an interesting question. Now I have an urgency to share the gospel with you. I, I would start probably with that a little earlier if I have the opportunity. There. It might, might be helpful for him to sort of turn the question back on her and ask her if she believes in a God and, and which one and why. Uh, and remind her of the urgency that I think he tried to set up in the right. question by saying, I'm dying and I've got five minutes. Uh, and just to sort of say, I'm asking this question not as an intellectual exercise, right. but because there really yeah. is a God. Right. And whether or not we know him and his son is what determines yeah. you know, the, right. the, the course of eternity uh, for us. And so just to turn it back, to yeah. get that diagnostic yeah. information. Yeah. See, I then, like what you're doing because what you're basically saying is then, okay, well, let me tell you what I'd tell you if you had five minutes right. to live. <laughs> exactly right. And uh, so exactly. that, that well, could be look, a good way to turn there's it. There's no yeah. truth of Scripture that you mm -hmm. can't get to the gospel from. And I, I mean, I love watching Mark Dever do this. I was, at a, mm -hmm. I was at a restaurant table in St. Andrews, Scotland with Timothy George, Mark Dever, and yours truly. And the waitress kept coming over to the table because she was fascinated with our various southern accents. In Scotland. Yeah, she just kept finding excuses to come back and, and listen to these southerners talk. And uh, in the course of time, we found out that she was going to go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as a nursing student. Mm -hmm. And she had never been more than 15 miles from St. Andrews, Scotland in her life. And, well, Mark Dever, that was, that was the crease that he needed. That's all he needed. He said, you know, when you go to a big city, one of the things you need is friends. And I don't, there are a lot of ways you can get a lot of friends. She said, you know anybody in Philadelphia? Didn't know anybody in Philadelphia. Was going to go stay with friends of friends in Philadelphia when she started nursing school. And he said, but you know, the best way that I think I know that you could meet friends is go to a good church. And from there, he was able to go into the gospel. And so I, I, I do think that there, any truth of the word is a way into a gospel conversation. And... I've said, David Sinclair is so good at that, Mark Dever is so good at that, that's one reason I love to be around these brothers because they help me know how naturally to get into those kinds of gospel conversations. All right, excellent. Uh, next question from Aaron Edwards, First Baptist Church, Concord, North Carolina. Uh, if a local church has a track record of not actively engaging in local and global evangelism, what steps and or initiatives should you consider as a pastor? to encourage the local church to engage in evangelism? How would you inspire slash motivate a congregation who seems to be indifferent mm. towards evangelism? Mm. Mark? Uh, preach on what a Christian is. Just in your sermons again and again, be very clear. You know, preach from the Gospels, what it means to follow Christ. Because what you probably have are a bunch of nominal people who don't really know the Lord. And if they can come to understand that, then you're going to have a lot of people converted in your own church. And once they really get a hold of the gospel, it's the kind of message you're just going to share. Now, if, you, if it's an unusual situation where you really do have a lot of people who are converted with lots of fruit of the Spirit, and this is just a kind of unusual, out-of-character hang-up, well then, you know, I agreed with what Matt Chandler just said in the address tonight. You know, a little bit of programs can be good. You know, there, there can be, there's some programs that are helpful. You can teach them two ways to live. You know, you, you, you can teach them uh, Christianity Explained or Christianity Explored, some way to study Mark's gospel. But generally, the kind of situation he's describing, I assume what you've got are a bunch of people who don't understand the gigantic issues we're talking about. And if they understood them, then the problem would begin to work itself out. Can we take that in a different direction, though? Let's assume that it's a church that is uh, 
that, that it, to some extent certainly loves the gospel, but doesn't yet have a vision for world missions, because that was the first part I heard in the question. And I, I think there are a lot of churches like that. And I think the pastor has to take responsibility, first of all, to preach the word in such a way that, that the gospel call is made clear. And, and going all the way back to the covenant with Abraham and onward, uh, God's purpose to bring glory to himself through the salvation from the nations and the peoples of the earth. And, and then, I think, praying regularly for unreached people groups and, and praying regularly for specific groups that they would hear the gospel, sending people from your church on mission trips. I don't mean missions tourism, but I mean missions trips. And I mean, and bringing missionaries into the church such that, that there can be an excitement of hearing what God is doing. You know, I, I think you go back to the birth of the modern missionary movement, and that's what the early missionary societies did. They, they sent missionaries into the churches to say, this is what we see. They had the churches begin concerts of prayer in which the churches, by their praying, had their hearts inclined to the nations, and we need to pray to see that happen. I think also, if in your preaching, you regularly address non-Christians directly. That's right. You know, and you, you, you give an example to your people of what it means to talk to a non-Christian as if they're a normal human being. Right. You know, they're, they're, they're not a caricature, but, you know, you raise questions with them, you share the gospel with them, and then your members see you having that heart and see mm -hmm. examples of how to do that. If that questioner wants to think more about this, uh, Edward Copeland did an excellent breakout session today on evangelism in the African American context. Don't let the, the title throw out. He did it in such a way that I think is applicable in every context. Um, and so I think you find some helpful stuff there. Amen. On. Great. Well, we're running short of time, so we have time for one more video, and it's with a little bit of fear and trembling that I uh, introduce video five. <laughs> Hi, my name is Blair Cushman, and I'm at Kerrville Bible Church in the Texas Hill Country. My question for you gentlemen is this. Is it wise for a pastor to be involved in local politics as a platform for evangelism in our communities? Additionally, Dr. Mueller, will you do America a favor and run for president in this upcoming election? <laughs> So Simon, as a Brit, let me contextualize this. Should, should we make Al our king? <laughs> I don't know how it works over there, but uh, any, any thoughts, Dr. Miller, since you were brought, dragged into this uh, on the first question about a pastor being involved in local politics? Yeah, I, well, he asked it in a specific way as I heard it, and he says a platform for evangelism. I would just say I don't think that's a platform for evangelism. And the church should not be known primarily for its political activity. Sometimes, it, especially in the local context, it might be quite unavoidable that Christians in that community will stand out because of a certain mandated moral stance they have to take in obedience to Scripture. And, or they might even become, in some sense, notorious for their commitment to human flourishing in terms of decisions being made in the, in the community. Th those would all be things that we would understand. But, uh, and and as, as a way of living out the command that, that was given by the Holy Spirit through Peter, that we are to live in such a way that people, that, that people speak well of us in the community. And, 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 or as Jesus said, let, let people see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. Those are, those are good godly things. So I think there's a sense in which sometimes such things are unavoidable. I wouldn't state it quite that way as a platform for evangelism. But uh, because I think in many ways it can become very distracting to evangelism. If you take that as a part of the church's mission, I think you're going to be uh, probably quite frustrated in trying to see how that is translated into evangelism. Simon, do you have any thoughts as a, somebody in England? Yeah, no, I think, I, I think actually in Britain, recent, more recently, people are slightly waking up to the need for Christians to... Um, take more of a public stance on, on, on issues like gay marriage and uh, uh, that has actually been a kind of needle uh, that's um, provoked us to take more of a stand I think but yeah not as a platform for evangelism. Mm -hmm. two, two things about the bookstore there are copies of Robert Benny's Good and Bad Thinking about religion and politics in the bookstore B-E-N-N-E -N -N -E. I would encourage you to look at that on this topic and also I asked the bookstore manager uh, about the pack the pallet thing, and we're about two thirds through what we're hoping to get through. So we've got about 4,000. You guys have bought about 4,000 of these Bibles. A pallet, 6,000. So we're about two thirds of the way through. So I would think if, if we would all go by there tonight, because it's open for another hour, hour and a half, mm -hmm. and maybe by another one or two, we could finish off that pallet. That'd be great to do for the brothers in Liberia. <laughs> 